afternoon, we're thinking together about why it is you do this on Sunday. Why this is important. In other words, why online church is not enough. And look, I said this last week and I said it in the first service this morning. I'm very grateful that we live in a time where the technology is available for us to gather remotely like we have for the last few months. To be able to continue uh, to worship through our Facebook page and to continue walking through the Word of God together. But there's a reason. In fact, there are multiple reasons why that's not sufficient over the long haul. Why we need to come together as a body week in and week out to worship. Last week from the book of Nehemiah, we learned that when we gather, we gather to hear from them. Well, we're going to be in Psalm 95 this morning. We're going to talk about gathering to respond to God. And if you've got the Bible, you can turn to Psalm 95. <laughs> Hear the word of the Lord. Well, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his. For he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as at Merah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness. When your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof that they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Father, we humbly will bless the simple reading and hearing of your word this morning. Father, plant it as a seed in our hearts. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would take what is planted and that you would cause it to bear fruit. Fruit that's in keeping with the gospel. Fruit that looks like a life that looks more like Jesus. We need your help there. So would you teach us? Would you lead us? Would you guide us? Would you help us not only to understand, but to apply our lives to your word? We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. Amen. So this song is essentially an invitation. Right? Three times in the context of this particular song, the psalmist writes, Oh, come, let us. That's verse 1. And then in verse 2, let us come. And then again in verse 6, O come, let us. And this is the perfect psalm to examine, the perfect psalm to make part of our own lives as we consider the importance of hearing and heeding that invitation to come together as the body of Christ. You see, this psalm is really an invitation to join the worship of God's people. And an invitation really, when it comes right down to it, to reorient our whole lives around the Lord. The simple invitation of the psalm is to gather, to sing, to bow down, to kneel, and to listen to God's voice. All in response to everything that God is for us and to all that God has done for us and to be reminded week in and week out 
as we receive and respond to this psalm's invitation that he is our God and we are his people. As the psalmist says, he is our salvation. He is our provider. He is our great God and King. He is creator and sustainer of all things. He is our maker. He is our shepherd, and we are his sheep. And last week we talked about gathering to hear from God, but we can't forget that truly hearing from God also must involve heeding the Lord's voice lest you and I come under the same judgment that the people of God who walked through 40 years of wilderness experience, right? That's exactly what the psalmist is referring to. And we're going to get there before our time is done today. But I just want to remind you that hearing and heeding the voice of the Lord is a very serious matter. In a real sense, when you and I gather we gather to respond to what God's already done in our lives. The psalmist calls God the rock of our salvation. And if you are in Christ Jesus today and you are walking by faith in Him, God is the rock of your salvation. And so the call of the psalmist is to come and sing, to come and praise, to come and give thanks to the God who has done so much. For you and for me. But we don't just come to respond to God. We don't gather in response to God. We, we now gather as God's people to in fact continue to respond to Him. To continue to respond to God's ongoing gracious work in our lives. And you and I do this. We do this gathering as participants. Remember last week, not just watchers, but witnesses to God's gracious work in our lives. Not just consuming content, which is so easy to do online, but being participants in. That's why the psalmist writes, let us sing praises to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise. Right, like that's the invitation for all of us who don't sing so well. And the psalm says it twice. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Make a joyful noise. Right? That's that's not only your permission slip, that's a command to make sure that you and I know, even if you can't sing, you should sing. Right? So come, let us make a joyful noise. Let us give thanks. Let us bow down. Let us worship. Let us kneel before God. Come and let us hear and respond to His Word. You see, this means at the very least, when you and I come into a service like this, and we, all, the, all the singing is done, and you're simply sitting, this doesn't mean that worship is over. Okay? When you and I are hearing the word read and hearing the word preached, we're still worshiping. In fact, that's exactly where the song goes. It goes from singing to being silent. And that's the movement of worship. The movement of worship, genuine worship, is from singing to silence. From speaking to listening. Because whose is the most important voice in the room? It's not mine. And it's not yours. It's God. So whenever you and I come to this part of the service, we come to the part of the service where it's time to listen worshipful. Where it's time to attend our mind and attend our hearts to the Word of God. After all, Jesus Himself, after He had been tempted by Satan in the wilderness, said, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth 
of God. And so the words that God has given us are wisdom and they are life. And so we should attend to them like that. You see, the weekly worship gathering is so vital to us because it's intended. It's intended to reorient us to the voice of God, not just our Sunday lives in terms of hearing, but our Monday through Saturday lives as well, to reorient us around the God who is always there, always deserving of our praise, always deserving of thanksgiving, and ultimately our listening ear. And so this entire psalm, this entire psalm as an invitation to come is really an invitation to have our lives reoriented around the Lord. First, the psalmist invites us to reorient our praise. Look in verse 1 again. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Now, here's a reality, okay? You and I will always praise what we prize. You and I will always praise what we prize. The things that we deem valuable, they will always find a way of bubbling to the surface and coming out in our words and in our way of life. So what are you talking about? More than that, let's dig a little bit deeper. What do you like to talk about? Let's dig a little bit deeper still. What, what, are, you, what are you adamant that others hear from you about? What do you champion with your words? What do you champion with your wallet? What are the things that you're invested in? We prize what we praise. Worship, when we gather in this room to do this, the goal of weekly worship is to help us prize the only one who is ultimately worthy of praise. Now, why would the living God, whom the psalmist says is a great God, the great king, in fact, above all gods, in other words, there's nobody above him, okay? Why would God invite us, even command us, to come and sing praises to him? Is God so small that he has to have the affirmations of little bitty human beings in order to get out of bed in the morning? <laughs> or is God in fact so prideful that he wants nothing more than to make us little creatures sing to him because he loves to hear the sound of his own name? <laughs> Do either of those things describe God? No, they don't. But did you know that in our day and time there are people who reject the God of the Bible because they think that God is a needy, self-centered deity who just feeds off of the praise of people. You and I have to be able to counter that. You and I have to be able to say, no, God doesn't need your praise or anyone's for that matter, but God deserves it. If God is indeed the greatest being in the universe, if God is indeed the highest of the high, then there's no one who deserves praise more than God. Not only does God deserve it, God doesn't need our praise, but you and I need to praise God. We are, or we were made, you and I were made to acknowledge God's worth. We were made to find our joy in God. And there's no higher person or thing in the universe than we, that we can prize and praise than God. You and I were made to find our greatest pleasure in pleasing Him. So we pray. We praise because that's what God made us for. We praise because a life of praise to God is the thing that gives us delight and joy. 
C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, the world rings with praise. Lovers praising their mistresses, readers their favorite poet, walkers praising the countryside, players praising their favorite game. I haven't noticed either that just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, so they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising. Isn't she lovely? Wasn't it glorious? Don't you think that's magnificent? The psalmists, in telling everyone to praise God, are doing what all people do when they talk about what they care about. And so we come together each and every Sunday, just as the psalmist invites us to do, to sing to the Lord, to make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. And God loves you and I enough to issue that invitation to us. If God called upon us to praise anything less than himself, he would be calling upon us to praise something less than himself, which wouldn't be what's best for us. God wants all of us, and he wants us to experience all of him. So he tells us to come and to praise him. Gathering together reorients our praise. But verse 2 teaches us that it also reorients us to grace. The psalmist writes, let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Again, let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Focus your heart and your mind on that invitation to come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Weekly worship is intended to remind us that everything is a gift. Everything. Everything we have, we have as a result of God's sheer kindness. Everything. From the incredible variety of the flowers and the trees that surround us, to the numerous kinds of fish that swim in our streams, to the fact that you and I were only able to get out of bed this morning because God allowed it. And then ultimately to the fact that God looked upon our helpless and hopeless condition as sinners and he chose to move forward toward us in mercy rather than wrath. All of it is grace. All of it. Ultimately, the fact that God has given us himself in and through Jesus Christ, that is the greatest grace of all. Paul called attention to this fact when he was writing to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. He said, for who sees anything different in you? What do you, what do you have that you did not receive? If you then received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Translation. What makes you think that you're better than somebody else? What makes you think your church is better than another church? If there are things praiseworthy about you, guess what? They're not reason for boasting. They're reason for what? Praising. Praising and giving thanks. Friends, if it's all a gift, if it's all a gift, think that we've somehow earned. Whether it's the things we think we've achieved that give us value or worth or status. Whether that comes down to possessions or position. All of those things are gifts. And the only appropriate response is what? What is it? Thank you. That's it. As God's people, grace is the air that we breathe in and breathe out. Literally. But this is so easy to forget. It's so easy to forget, which is yet another reason that you and I need to hear and to heed the come let us 
of this song. You see, in our pride, we are prone to take credit. You and I, in our pride, are prone to take credit for our accomplishments, for our possessions, for our position. And look, you probably know as well as I do that our culture does not help us here. In subtle and not so subtle ways, you and I are discipled by the world around us to think about life in terms of consuming and gaining and getting ahead. And look, whether we admit it or not, our value as people is often wrapped up in how far ahead of the next guy in the rat race we can get. Or how much we can possess, or what it is that we possess, or all of the resources that will allow us to possess more and more and more and more and more and more and more. Perfect example. Perfect example. Think about how Black Friday has encroached upon Thanksgiving Thursday. Amen. <laughs> now think just a moment with me about the cultural insanity of it all. No sooner, no sooner have we gotten up from the Thanksgiving dinner table than all of the stores are now inviting us to come and get more things. And without even knowing it, without even knowing it, you and I, like Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, are being shaped into a worldly mold that can't even stop long enough to acknowledge God's grace in all that we do have before pushing us to want more and to get more. Amen. Man, wow. It's an uphill battle, y'all. To continually be thankful and content with what the Lord has given us. That's why gathering for worship week in and week out is so important. It's intended to remind us that, that everything's a gift, but, but, but more than that, to shape us into givers who reflect the heart of the giver. You see, the biblical call is not to get more. The biblical call is what? Give more. Give more. <laughs> give more. To give like the heart of the giver himself who gave us his one and only greatest treasure in his son. That's partly, y'all, why, why giving to the Lord is an important part of our weekly worship. The, the goal isn't only faithful weekly giving to the ministries of this local church, but becoming the kind of grace-saturated person who reflects the character of God, not, not only when you come into this room, but into your everyday life. By the way, when you give to Mountain View Church, understand you're not giving to the church, you're giving to who? You're giving to the Lord. First and foremost, He owns it all anyway. Second of all, He requests and commands and expects all of it from us. And so when you and I give a portion, we're simply saying, Lord, thank you. Or take this, use it for your glory, multiply it, so that your name and your fame can be extended to the ends of the earth. You see, gathering reorients not only our praise, it reorients our lives around grace. And this reminder that in and through Jesus Christ it's all gift, but it also reorients our devotion. Look at verses 3 through 5. For the Lord is a great God. Now, now that four, right, like that's, that's a because statement. So the psalmist is saying, let us sing, let us make a joyful noise, let us come into his presence with thanksgiving for or because the Lord is a great God and a great king above all God. In his hand are, watch this, the depths of the earth to the lowest valleys and the heights of the mountains. So everything, top to bottom, belongs to God. But then watch what the next verse says. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. So depths and heights, sea and land. Are there any things in all of that that God did not make? No. 
Are there any things in all of creation that God himself does not sustain? No. It's all his. It's all his. And so when you and I gather to worship, we're, we're called to remember, as the psalmist says, that there's no one greater, there's no one higher. All of creation, including you and I, owe our existence to God. That's why the first two of the Ten Commandments read as they do. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. And God spoke all of these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness or anything that's in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now these are the first two of ten words for a reason. Get them right. And everything else falls in line. Get them wrong, and everything else will be crooked. Idolatry. Idolatry is subtly mentioned in Psalm 95, where the psalmist says, For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all little g God. And of course, it's directly spoken to in Exodus chapter 20, where God tells the people very, very clearly, I have no other gods before me, and don't make any kinds of images that you worship as God. Now, what is idolatry? Let me back up for just a second. Idolatry is a bit of an ancient concept for us in some ways, okay? Because we don't necessarily have temples to the worship of false gods and false goddesses that the ancient people of Israel would have encountered uh, from the cultures all around them. But that doesn't mean idolatry no longer exists. You know what it means? It means we've just gotten more sophisticated. Yes. Think of the fact that uh, you carry around um, a little computer in your pocket that is probably more powerful than all of the computers that launched the Saturn V rocket into space 60 years ago. <coughs> technology, technology, right? The same is true today. Idolatry then looked like a temple to Aphrodite. Idolatry today might not look like that temple, but it doesn't mean sexuality is not an idol in our culture. Because it is. What is idolatry? Idolatry is giving to any created thing the devotion that God alone deserves and is seeking from that created thing the meaning, the purpose, the significance, and even the salvation that only God can give. Idolatry is the biggest problem in the Bible. The biggest Problem. From front to back, it is shown to be the sin beneath every sin. And friends, weekly worship is intended to expose these God substitutes and remind us that there is only one Lord worthy of worship. More than this, to help us repent of our idolatry and to return to the one in whom our salvation is secured. Want to know what the idols might be in your own life? They're not very hard to see. Sometimes it just takes some diagnostic questions to help. What do you not have that would make life worth living if you have it? 
What do you not have? What are you chasing after that you think will make life worth living if you get it? Second, what do you have that would make life not worth living if you lost it? What do you currently have that if you lost it, you don't think you could go on? Third, what causes you to get unrighteously angry? Now, anger is not a bad emotion. Anger is a God-given emotion. But there is a thin line between righteous anger and unrighteous anger, and we cross it all too quickly and all too easily. But a good way to know what your idols are, or to kind of see them for what they are, is maybe to get to the bottom of your anger. In other words, we try to protect our idols, to protect those things that people are trying to take from us or that we feel like the world wants to take from us. If something makes you unrighteously angry, that might be an idol. Where do you and I run for comfort when things get uncomfortable? Psalm 46 says that our God is a refuge, that our God is a very present help in time of trouble. Where should we run to when things get uncomfortable? To Him. But so many times we don't. Where do you run when things get uncomfortable? Where do you run for peace when the walls of stress close in around you? What's your outlook? Well, it's not bad to have an outlet. But if we're not running to the Lord for peace, if we're running to other things first, that might be an idolatry. Each and every week, when we gather right here in this room, we want to see God disclose, uh, defeat, and dismantle those God substitutes that we cherish and enthrone Himself at the very center of our life. Each week when we gather, we want to see the Holy Spirit get to the diseased roots that are producing the rotten fruit in our lives. And we want to see Him cut off all of those idols and replace them with King Jesus and the fruit that comes from being intimately, personally, and powerfully connected to Him. Friends, this is the reason why we fiercely protect the time we spend together on Sunday mornings. We don't want anything to take the spotlight off of God. Look, you're out there 166 hours a week doing battle against idolatry. We would be doing you an injustice if we came into this room week in and week out and we just played church for an hour and a half wouldn't be helpful. I want you to give your Sundays, I want you to give your Mondays to the Lord, your heart, your home, your fears, and your finances. And look, we cannot promote that if we're simply giving you week in and week out the same things that the world is feeding. Gathering reorients us to praising the one who's worthy. It reorients us to grace. Gathering reorients our devotion. And gathering reorients our ears too. Notice where the psalm goes in verse 6. Oh, come let us bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God. And we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His kingdom. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now notice how the psalm moves from praying to bowing to listening. From speaking to the Lord to silence before the Lord. As I've already said, that's the movement of worship. It's a movement of humility, of preparing to receive from and respond to the great high king of heaven. And we must, um, we must be sure that if we're not really responding to the voice of the Lord, then we're not really listening to the voice of the Lord. More than that, look, if our, word, if our worship consists of just empty words 
sung or spoken, but unresponsive hearts, then our worship is empty. It's empty. In other words, we're not really he hearing God's word unless we're heeding God's word. That's exactly what James, the brother of Jesus, says in his New Testament letter. James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Did you catch what James says? He says if you're a hearer only, but not a doer. In other words, if you listen to it, it goes in one ear and out the other. You take no consideration for how your life needs to change in light of what the word is saying then you might need to check yourself. You might need to do a soul checkup. If hearing the word of Christ, in other words, does not translate into obedience, then you might well be fooling yourself into thinking that your faith is real. Real faith produces the real fruit of obedience. Real faith produces the real fruit of obedience. And I want to tell you something, because I've heard this way too many times, okay? If you are not listening and responding to the very clear voice of God in the Scriptures, don't expect to be able to discern the voice of the Lord in other ways. If you're clearly violating God's written word, don't expect that he's going to give you a more specific word about a particular situation in your life. And if you think you've received one, it's probably best to think again. It may just be those bad eggs that you ate for breakfast. <laughs> Soften 
ready hearts that will receive it, or the Word will harden hearts that do not receive it. I will never forget that. It's an important reminder that when the Word goes forth, you and I are to heed it. And this psalm reminds us that that's a choice that comes about each and every day. Look at how the psalm ends. Verse 7. Today. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness. Today. To death. Here's the point in the whole song. God is speaking to you and to me now as certainly as he was when this psalm was written. <coughs> Excuse me. And back before that, during the time that the psalmist is writing about. The psalmist says today, right now, right now, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do not respond like the generation he's writing about. Now what is he writing? Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20 verse 1. Listen to this. And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zen in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation. And notice what they do. Notice what they do, and notice how it contrasts with the song, okay? They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished with our, when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there's even no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron your brother, and tell the rock... No, what did he say? What did he say? Tell the rock. Tell him. Okay? Yeah. Tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded them. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly back together before the rock, and he said to them, Here now, you rebels! <laughs> now, that explains what's about to follow. Yep. <laughs> Moses is fit to be tied. Yes. Moses is frustrated with this people who time and time again do not believe that the Lord is going to care for them, provide them, protect them, and lead them all the way to the promised land. In fact, Moses is so frustrated by their unbelief that their unbelief becomes what? Yes. His own unbelief. Wow, y'all. Look at what the text says. And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff. Now, God being gracious provided water for the people anyway. Because that's his character. But this entire scene is the very reason that Moses did not get to go into the promise. Amen. This scene is the entire scene that the psalmist is writing. The psalmist is saying today, today, you have the opportunity. You have the opportunity to hear and to heed the word of the Lord. Don't be like those people of the past, even Moses himself, who heard 
but did not heed. <clears throat> Who heard, but did not heed. Make a different choice. Make a different choice. The psalm ends on a note of judgment. The psalm ends by saying, for 40 years I loathed that generation and said they are a people who go astray in their hearts and they've not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Folks, the choice that they had between faith and unbelief, between trust and distrust, is the choice that's before you and I, not only today, that's the choice that will be in front of you tomorrow. When you wake up on Monday morning, trust, unbelief. When you wake up on Tuesday morning, trust, unbelief. When you wake up on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, trust or unbelief. Gathering on Sunday, puts that choice front and center and is intended to remind us that it's always there. It's always there. And look, I, I want you, I want you to have a renewed and unshakable confidence in the rock of your salvation when you leave this building on Sunday. So that when you walk into Monday morning, you're not bowing down to substitute saviors and trying to wring out of them what the Lord alone can give you. At the same time, the urgency of this psalm, the, the, the invitation to today reminds us of the urgency of getting the word out. So that others might hear and heed the invitation, God's gracious invitation to life. You see, the beauty of this song is that it's not just an invitation to come to church. More important than that, it's an invitation to hear and to heed God's good word of salvation. To repent of rejecting Christ and to embrace Him as Savior and King. So I want to invite the worship team to come on up and prepare to lead us in response this morning. But if you're here this morning and you are under the sound of my voice, if you have heard the word preached with your ears, then my friend, today, today, you are hearing the Lord's call upon your life to turn from living for yourself and to turn instead to live for Jesus who died for you. To turn in faith to Him, to turn away from your sin, and to come home to the only true and living God. Now what I can't do, and what this worship team can't do, is cause that message to move from your physical ears to your spiritual ears. But the Spirit of God can do it. And I pray that He would this morning. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the message is essentially the same. You and I don't get saved and re-saved every day, but it's still a battle. It is a battle between unbelief and faith. Will we trust the God who is the rock of our salvation on whom we can depend? My prayer is that you will, I will, and you will. Let's pray.